All right. You know, to, today we're, we're, we've been going through the book of Matthew, and we, we're coming apro- upon a portion of Scripture that's really interesting because it's talking about something that we don't experience too much in the United States of America. And this is the subject, persecution. There's persecution around the world. You know, in America, I mean, in the world right now, there's over 340 million Christians living in places where they're experienced, where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. Last year alone, 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith. Last year, 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. Last year, 4,277 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and in prison. When you talk about these thousands of people that are experiencing persecution, here in America, we don't experience much persecution. But when Jesus began to train the disciples, he trained them with this understanding that they would be sheep among wolves. What he told them was that not maybe you'll experience persecution, you will experience persecution for your faith, what you stand for, for your morals, for your lifestyle. And he told them this, they hated me and they'll even hate you. And there was a lot of conversation about this subject of a, about persecution. And then you wonder why would he talk about persecution so much? He was preparing them for the warfare of, of Christianity, the warfare, the spiritual warfare that they would experience taking this message to areas that would not receive the message. They would have opposition. They would have spiritual opposition. They'd have religious opposition. And it would even mean at times that they would have to give their lives for what they believed. Now just think about this. When, when, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he told his disciples to go to an upper room. He goes, go to this room and don't leave that room until something happens. I want you to get, this is what I want, I want you to receive. I want you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you can be bold witnesses. Now, this is a little odd speaking to American congregation because a lot of things that we think are persecution are not persecution. Just because you got a flat tire on the, way to, on the way to church, that's not persecution. Oh my gosh, the devil's after me. He doesn't care about you getting to church. What he cares about is you carrying out a mission. What he cares about is that you're making a difference. What he cares about is that you're making disciples. What he cares about is that you're causing damage. He's losing souls. He cares about that. So the purpose of persecution is to stop advancement. What's the purpose of persecution? So persecution is meant to stop advancement. Persecution is meant to shut you up. So it would be a threat, like we're going to persecute you or shut up. But, but, but in America, we don't have a lot of persecution. And I'm thinking maybe we don't have a lot of persecution because not many of us are speaking up outside of church. So our, our faith is here, our hallelujahs are here, our praise is here, but when we go out into the regular world and we go to the business and we go to the career and we go to our neighborhoods, could it be that there's a whole bunch of silence and Satan is actually saying, why persecute a church or a group of people that aren't actually doing the mission? You guys get that? So he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to be bold witnesses. To be what? Now that word witnesses is a weird word because that word witness means it's the, it means martyr. Like, like I'm going to give you the power to represent me to the point of persecution and death. What it was saying is I'm, you're going to have to get the Holy Spirit so when you're threatened, you don't, you don't back up. You don't quit. You don't go backwards. You go forward even to the point of death. Now, we need to talk about this in, the t- in today's church because we need to get this type of Christianity back. That we're living for this, and this message is so important 
And people's eternal lives are so important that I'm willing to live for Christ. I'm willing to die for Christ. But this is one thing for sure. I'm not backing up under any threats, under any pressure. I'm going to live for Christ. Do we have any believers like that? Life is short. Let's make it count. Life is short. Let's what? Make it count. There's a lot of recruiting going on. I was talking to Gabriel, and Gabriel is telling me that he wants to do a Christian event at the Orange Show with a whole bunch of young adults. And he was saying, maybe we could do like a Christian, they don't, they're going to think it's a rave, but it's not a rave, but it will be a rave, but not really. I go, that sounds a little sneaky. But I, I know his idea, what he's thinking about. And what he was saying is, right now when they have raves over here at the Orange, Orange, um, Orange Fairgrounds here, this is what happens. There, there's thousands upon thousands of young adults and teens that come. All the hotels are sold out. The freeways are packed. You could have 30,000 teenagers, 40,000 teenagers, 100,000 teenagers that will show up right here in San Bernardino for a rave. And, and we're, 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 we say, what are we, what are we talking about? That there's a group of people out there that are hurting, broken, and lost. And this is what God is saying. Where's my church at? My church, and this is where I said, our church is right here. And God's raising up a church that's ready to go out there and make an impact in this world. And we're even willing to die for this. Are there any believers like that here? So let's talk about this for just a minute. I want to give you three facts about persecution. Fact number one, this is important about persecution. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. In Matthew 5.10 it says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The word persecute means that you're being pursued with a, someone's pursuing you with a desire to harass you, mistreat you, injure you, beat you, torture you, destroy you because of your beliefs, morals, and message. Persecution means that there's actually somebody after you. Now, persecution happens through people. Satan uses people to persecute people. I'm not saying that you can't have dem demonic torment, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about persecution. Is that actually someone is assigned to you to get you off track. Someone's assigned to you to discourage you. Someone is assigned to you to depress you. Someone's assigned to you to cause you to give up. Someone's assigned to you to shut your mouth. And what Jesus was saying, if you get serious about this assignment of sharing the good news so people are saved and set free and become disciples of Jesus Christ, understand eventually you're going to get persecution because Satan is going to know from hell, wait a second, we got somebody that's making a difference in this world. We're losing souls out of hell. Let's send some persecution. We got to get ready for this because we need some Christians that have some backbone. I'm going to get that. We don't, we cannot affect the world if we're thinking like the world, we're talking like the world, come on, we're, we're dancing like the world, we're talking like the world, we're going to have to make up our minds. I'm not like the world, I'm like Jesus, and I got a purpose on this earth, and my purpose is to reach people for Jesus. I make disciples of Jesus Christ, and I'm willing to do this even if it requires my life. Someone say sold out. Now, if I was Jesus, I wouldn't bring this up. Because this doesn't sound like the benefit package. Like, follow me, and you could die. Follow me, and you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be people that are going to put... See, Christianity has become 
I think people become Christians to live safe instead of fulfill purpose. And this is why we can't affect the world. We're too safe. We're more concerned about how we look and how we feel than the mission. But I believe that God is raising up in these last days some sold out, 100% in believers that are saying the mission is so important that I'll even give up my safety. Can I hear an amen out there? All right. Imagine someone being assigned to you only because you're talking too much about Jesus. Imagine someone being assigned to stop you because your lifestyle is reflecting too much light. Imagine someone being assigned to you because when they see you, you convict them of their sin and they want to erase you. We got to erase her. I don't like the way she makes me feel around her. Because I want to continue living in my sin without any conviction. So let's see if we can erase that church. Let's see if we can erase that group. Let's see if we can erase that man. Let's see if we can erase that young man. And God is saying, come on, they're going to try to erase you, but it's not going to work. Because the more they persecute you, the more I bless you. It's going to backfire. Someone says it's going to backfire. They tried to persecute Jesus. It backfired. He died and resurrected from the dead and saved the whole world. They tried to persecute Daniel and they threw him in the lion's den. The God showed up and shut the lion's mouth. And this is what happened. The king had to make a declaration. Everybody bowed down to Daniel's God. They tried to, they tried to persecute Joseph and they put him in prison. And then he gets a promotion and he becomes head of the whole nation of Egypt and begins this shot call right from that position after the persecution. Can anybody get, come on, get through great persecution to get through two great ministry? The world is see. I want you. To, I want you to understand. The world is trying to see if what you believe is real, and it's only under pressure and resistance do we have an opportunity to show them, "Hey, this is real." Okay, so now there's two types of persecution. This, these are two types. One is physical persecution. And then there's verbal per, commu, uh, per, uh, persecution. In Matthew 5, 11, it says this, God blesses you when people mock you. What? So you bless me? You know, when we sneeze, we say, God bless you. But God says, when you're persecuted, God says, I bless you. I love this. How many want some blessings from God? When people mock you, look at this, and persecute you. He didn't say if. When people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. See, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. He goes, when that happens, you're getting ready to get, a, you're ready, you're getting ready to get blessed by God. Before the blessing comes the persecution. When people mock you, this is what you should do. You should cuss them out. When they make fun of you, you cap on them. You don't cap on me. I'm a master capper. When people lie about you, expose them on Facebook. Like expose all their dirty secrets. Or oh, you lie about me. You just messed with the wrong Christian. I just, I was okay until you stop. The truth will set all of us free. I'm going to let the truth come. So we know about Christian gangsterism. 
We know a lot about Christian gans- gangsterism. But God don't bless you when you act like them. God blesses you when you act like him. What he's saying, I got your back. Is there anybody that could be lied about and still keep your character in check? And not forget about your mission. Well, they lied about me. Do you know some persecution is going to happen right here in the church? I'm going to leave the church. Why? Someone lied about you? She can't handle a little persecution? Is it true or not? Because if it's true, then that's not persecution. That's just the truth. And if it's not true, why are you tripping? Just keep going forward. Come on, make disciples. Come on, go out there and preach the gospel. Prove it when it's all said and done by casting out demons. Who knows, maybe that person that's lying about you, you're going to come up here. Let me, let me sketch you free from that lying spirit. You never know. Because some of the people that are persecuting you are the next people you're going to reach. They lie about you. They speak evil against you. That means their words are meant to cause pain, bring trouble, cause hurt. Any word, they have a, words with malicious intent. I, I, I sometimes would rather physical persecution than verbal. Physical persecution represents going to prison or them beating you, or some torture. But I think what hurts sometimes more than that is people that you love and you know, and they start turning, they start turning evil on you. And then when that happens, you don't even know what to do if you don't get instruction like this. Because your feelings start, start coming up like, uh uh-uh, uh uh-uh, uh-uh. It's a principle of the matter. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. You just start, you start quoting all kinds of hyperbole stuff. It's not, it's not even scripture. <laughs> so persecution, there's two types, physical and what? So if someone slaps you because you preach the gospel, that's physical persecution. Now, that's crazy. Jesus was preparing the, these disciples for physical persecution and verbal persecution. He goes, and when they do that, not if they do that, when they do that, because they're tired of hearing what you're saying, understand this, I got your back. They're going to try to put you down, but it's going to work opposite because I set this up spiritually that every time they persecute you, I'm going to release greater blessing upon your life. So this is what's going to happen. Every time they persecute you, you're going to absorb it and you're going to become more powerful and more powerful. It's going to backfire on them. You're going to be more anointed. You're going to have more love. You're going to be more effective. You got more influence. So what he was saying, persecution is an opportunity for greatness. Every great man and woman of God has gone through persecution, and this is what's happened. They've been elevated. It's just a test. Pass the test and be promoted. Now, persecution, I'll say it again, is the highest level of enemy resistance. It's the what? The enemy uses persecution as a last resort. He only does it after he's tried everything else and it hasn't worked. See, when he threw the doubt at you and it didn't work, he goes, well, let's throw this. A distraction and it didn't work. Temptation and lust and it didn't work. Now, if it works, there's no persecution coming because I already got them. I didn't have to go all the way to persecution. They just got stopped by their girlfriend. Their boyfriend already captured them. I don't need to persecute them. They are already stopped. Their conversation is now about puppy love. They're no longer talking about Jesus. They've lost their mission. They got trapped by a relationship. 
And I wonder how many lower level demons are working, and higher level demons are waiting for a church to wake up and not fall for lower level assignments of the enemy. Someone say, wake up! This, this afternoon something happened to me, or it was yesterday. I, I was watching on YouTube some, some um, videos, um, and there were like court cases, stuff like that. I fell asleep. I woke up, and when I woke up, I don't know how YouTube does it. Once in a while, they just keep going without me pressing nothing. So when I woke up, it was a 2020, 2020 segment about young la- a young lady committed suicide. And what they were saying is how she got, she got cyberbullied because she did something that really hurt her reputation while she was online. She started at nine years old just singing online, and she became addicted to the attention. And every time they gave her a like, she loved it. And they, they, wow, that was awesome. She loved it to the point that she would hide hours in her room, do different songs, and do everything she can to perform for the webcam. Well, she got to the point that she had to go deeper in her performance, and there was a a man that showed up on there, and he says, you are so beautiful. Can you show me some skin? So what she did one time, she flashed them. They caught the image, and they put the image on, they put the, they, they put the image on, on porn sites. So this, and they sent it to all her friends. And they sent it to her mother. So she's a seventh grader, and now she's all messed up. She can't go to school. She's suicidal. Say, Pastor, what does this have to do with? Well, I'm going to share what it had to do with me. So while I'm, while I'm, I'm like captivated, but then when I'm captivated, I start seeing that they're showing images at the 2020. They're showing images uh, of girls, you know, that, that aren't, they, they're not showing like stuff, but they're kind of showing stuff. And I started realizing, whoa, 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 whoa. This sounds like it's a trap here. I thought I was interested in a documentary, and all of a sudden this turned into a lust show. So I started realizing that this was a trap, even though the storyline was very interesting, and I feel for that girl, and I'll pray for her, and I know she needs the the healing power of God, and she needs to be saved, and she needs to get set free. I got to stop it. I didn't didn't finish watching that video. I turned it off. I'll tell you why I turned it off. Because I didn't want to get trapped right there by lust. Because one video would have turned into another video, would have turned into another video, and then I'm up here preaching as a lustful pastor. Pastor, can't you just say sorry before you come on the pulpit? Well, yeah, I could do that, but it's not real. Because when I had an opportunity to say no and you're not going to get me, there's a big difference with repenting right before I come up here and saying no in the middle of the battle. All I'm saying is I'm not going to let you trap me. The only thing that could, I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to have to raise the level of resistance. And if you raise the level of resistance to persecution, I'm just going to get blessed more, anointed more, and this wasn't going to happen. The gospel is going to be spread farther to farther regions of the United States of America and the world. How many understand that? Is there anybody that's saying, come on, let's fight? So the doubt didn't work, the bad company didn't work, the unhealthy relationships didn't work, the, the love of money didn't work, and the things, uh, the, the love of money and things didn't work, apathy didn't work, the amount of strongholds didn't work, being offended didn't work. Let's go to persecution now. We got to raise it up. We got to raise it up because hopefully this will stop them. Is there a church that can handle persecution and trust in God's blessings? Come on, come on, let's give the Lord. Come on, let's come on, let's get ready. Right. Fact number one, God blesses those who are per- What does God do to those who are persecuted? He what? Blesses them. He what? Fact number two, the godly will be persecuted. Who will be persecuted? I'm going to have to do a two-part series on this one right here because we got some serious stuff coming up. And you know what we're doing? We're preparing to change the world. Someone said, we're getting ready. 
That's like a football coach not preparing his team for hard tackles. Guys, let's not tackle each other in practice very hard, you know, because uh, we don't want anybody to get hurt. And you know what's going to happen when they, they go in a real game and their head starts ringing after they get hit and it's just a gong show, boom. They're going to walk off that field defeated because they weren't prepared for the hit. And God is saying, it doesn't matter what hits come your way. No weapon formed against you to prosper. You're going to be able to handle this and it's going to make you more effective. Fact number two, we'll be persecuted. See, Jesus is teaching us about persecution to prepare us for spiritual hardships of living for God. They resisted and persecuted Jesus, and they will persecute us if we live like him, talk like him, think like him, and carry his mission. 2 Timothy 3.12, it says this, yes. Someone say yes. And everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Hallelujah. Nobody memorizes that scripture. I can do all things through Christ. Well, that's what it's talking about. You can go through suffering through, with Christ. Oh, I thought it was just talking about, you know, me overcoming the obstacles in my life to become successful. <laughs> you guys understand that? So it says... It says the godly, everyone who wants to live godly life in Christ, just will suffer what? There's no such thing as being a world changer, a bold witness, a disciple maker, a light in the dark, in the dark world without experiencing some sort of resistance. Someone said there'll be resistance. But this is what God says. When they persecute you, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. You know what that means? Is the persecution will not outweigh my blessing. My wet blessing will outweigh the persecution. And that means when it's all said and done, you're going to be more blessed before you went into the persecution than after you came out of the persecution. How many of you understand that's good news? Okay, so now, fact three, fact number three, fact three. It says this, God doesn't bless us for doing wrong. Wait, 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 wait. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. All I'm saying is God don't bless us for doing wrong, though. So what does that mean? It does not qualify as persecution when we are facing consequences for bad attitudes. Well, they're just persecuting because you're Christian. No, they're not persecuting because you're Christian. You got a bad attitude. Oh. It's not persecution when you're being corrected for being irresponsible at work. Well, you know, they're just persecuting me because I'm a Christian and they saw the way we're allowed to sticker on the back of the car. That's why they're persecuted. They're not persecuted because of that. They're perse that's not persecution. They're correcting you because you show up to work late and you don't finish any assignments. And you think just because you're a Christian, you got some Holy Ghost pass. Well, they're not Christians. I don't have to obey them. Yes, you do. You're misrepresenting Christ. When you're representing Christ and you're irresponsible, they correct you and then you have attitude. You know what they start saying? I ain't going to hire no Christians. That people are crazy. They're irresponsible. They, they, they have this entitlement. Don't you know I'm a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Almighty God? <laughs> Don't not touch God's anointed. I am one of the anointed. <laughs> there you go. No, you're one of the crazy people. Like, you're crazy. You're like fanatical. That's, way, that's whack. I don't want to be like you. And we're not promoting you. I'm just tripping. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I am tripping. Huh? But this is what the idea is. We got a lot of stuff that we've categorized under persecution. It's not persecution. We're just, those are called consequences. And some of it's called punishment. 
And, and see, as a Christian, you should be able to handle correction because you want to start living right. If you struggle with correction, this is what's happened. You're not being persecuted. You're rebellious. It's persecution. That's what it is. No, it's not. See, we, when we're rebellious and are hard to work with, and they look past us for the promotion, that is not persecution. <laughs> when we're living a double life and they call you a hypocrite, that's not persecution, that's the truth. Well, you know, I'm not here to be anybody's example. Jesus is the only example. <laughs> He's the only righteous one overall. And if there's anybody good, there's only one that's good, and that's Jesus. He said it himself. Who's good? I am. I'm not good. Could it be that you're excusing your dysfunction? You're excusing your responsibility? You're excusing, come on, you're excusing that you're supposed to be a light? Come on, you gotta, you, we got to tighten up your life. we got to tighten up the bulb so it starts showing some light again. And what God is saying, if they're, right now we're here to be a light, and this is, all that other stuff is not persecution. Okay. 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 1 Peter 4.14, it says this. If you are insulted... Because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. So why are you insulting me? Because you, name, you bear the name of Christ. I go, okay, I'm being blessed. I, I told you guys this before that, that I remember when I was at my job and, and um, I, I used to bring Bible tracts and I was at my job. Uh, I was in a car business and I was the only Christian <laughs> in the whole dealership. I, I would actually share my faith. And I began to disciple people, and I began to have Bible studies on Tuesday nights, and people would come to my house, and I was leading people to Christ. Well, one of the guys I led to Christ was, um, his name was Robert Wallace, and he was a guy like six foot three. Um, he was very militant when I met him. Like no one wanted to get Robert Wallace mad because he'd come in his military attire ready to fight everybody in the whole store. And I go, that's the kind of guy I want to see saved. So I started inviting Robert Wallace to my house, and I led him to the Lord. He became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as radical as he was out there trying to fight everybody, he became that radical for God. So Robert Wallace, um, he goes, I want to witness to the people at the dealership. So what he did, he got some Bible tracts, little booklets that explained the, uh, the plan of salvation. And he left them in the bathroom because when people are, people are in the bathroom, this is what they do. They read. So he goes, what a great idea. Let's go ahead and put Bible tracts in the bathroom so when they go in there, we can spread the gospel. And I'm like, right on, Robert. I didn't even know he did it. But, radical, but Robert's becoming pretty radical. Well, this is what happened. The general manager of the store is the next person who goes to the bathroom, and he's a Jew. And the first thing he finds on the top of the toilet are Bible tracts. It's Friday, Friday morning. Friday morning is our biggest meeting of the whole week. All the salespeople, all the managers, everybody comes in on this Friday morning. There's like 35 people in a small room. This is a room that no way it would be COVID safe. Everybody's in that room, right? No one's wearing masks, right? We're in that room two feet apart. The, we're getting ready for our meeting. It's our biggest meeting of the week. The general manager is so mad after seeing this Bible track in the office. What he does, he literally comes in the room and jumps on the conference table. So mad he's red. He takes the, he takes the Bible track and throws it on the table. And he says, whose Bible track is this? Marco. Because he knew if anybody brought this, it's him. <laughs> Keep this stuff out of the dealership. This is not a church. 
I got 35 salespeople in there. They're all looking at me. He has his finger in my face. He is screaming. He goes, Marco, promise me you'll never, ever bring this stuff into this dealership again. I'm not exaggerating. It was worse than that. And he's pointing his finger in my face. And I go, what do I say? Because I was sitting down in a chair. I'm taller than him in real life, but he's on this table. I was like, I dare you to say that when you're off the table. I dare you to say that out back. Without, without, not, none of the backup, just me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many know those thoughts do come, though? Just because they come doesn't mean you need to go with them. <laughs> right? So this is what happened. He tells her, promise me. And I remember his name was Kenny. I go, Kenny, I can't. I love you too much to promise you that. I care about your soul. I didn't say, that's not my, that's not my Bible track. That's Robert Wallace. <laughs> How many know that would have missed the whole point? There's no blessing that comes with that. You got to swallow that persecution and let it elevate you. Stay in the spirit. So I, I'm still witnessing. I'm still trying to save souls. And now what ended up happening, because it was such a great answer, if I might not say so myself, the Holy Spirit led me with that answer. Go, Man, what a great answer. He could, this is what happened. The whole, the whole room started clapping for me. And they're like, wow, great. What, uh, what, uh, what a great answer. Wow. So what was he going to do now? He couldn't keep up those cra that craziness. So he goes, Marco, I wish you had those answers for your customers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> the next Bible track will be. <laughs> I didn't commit not to bring Bible tracks because I got a mission. But you know what happened two months later? Because... Kenny knew this guy's for real because under pressure, his job was on the line. I'm screaming at him. He has peer pressure. I'm persecuting him, and he's still not backing down. So this is what happened. He, had a, he bought a brand new house in Redlands. It was a 5,000-square-foot home. He just finished buying a brand new Ferrari. He's living it up. But this is a problem. His sin is messing him up. So what he ends up doing is sleeping with one of the sales ladies. This is what happens. He gets her pregnant. He's the general sales manager. No, general manager. Part owner. He calls me in. It wasn't... I would say a month later into his office crying. He goes, Marco, please pray for me. I've messed up. I go, Kenny, I told you I love you and I'm going to pray with you and let me introduce you to Jesus. That moment of persecution was opening up my influence over the whole dealership. What the enemy meant to shut me up, to get me to quit, to throw in the towel, God says, I'm going to use it to promote you. And all God is saying, don't you let a little pressure, a little intimidation stop you from living for God. Let's get to the place. Uh, okay, let's get to the highest level because if we could get to the highest level of this fight, we could get to the highest victories of this fight. Is there anybody here that's willing to go all the way even to the levels of persecution so we can start doing some pro ball? I'm tired of playing in the minor leagues. Let's get to the big leagues. Let's get to the men and women of the Bible that every single one of them were persecuted, but to this day, they've changed the world. They've written scripture. They've gotten revelation. They were world changers. They were known as turning the world upside down because you could not stop them even under pressure. 
So what did God cover? What did the Lord teach us today? Look, if you are, look at this, 1 Peter 4, 14, this is it. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. For the glorious spirit of, spirit of God rests on you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, prying into other people's affairs, because that's not persecution. That's punishment. <laughs> we got to get rid of this prison mentality that we did a crime and we don't take responsibility. Because this is what's happened. You'll never be re rehabilitated. You'll never get to the next level. That's not persecution. We're right now in California, United States of America, there's little persecution. But I really believe that there's going to be a day that there's going to be a prophetic word and you're going to have to go back to this word and say, wait a second, didn't Pastor Marco talk about this? Because we're going to get to a point that Christians are going to be so on fire, full of the Spirit of God and changing their world that the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop us and we're already ready for this. Do whatever you need to do to stop us. We're not stopping. We're going to keep on going forward. And the more you persecute us, the more this thing spreads. We, we don't die. We multiply. Come on, come on. Are there anybody down here? Good live for God. Let's all stand up. You guys are awesome. Woo-wee. Okay. Next week, I got some good stuff because I, really, I want to talk about this just a little bit more. I want to talk about three blessings next, next week that are released upon the believer when they, when they are persecuted. What it's saying is these blessings will not be released until persecution hits. How many want some blessings? I'll say, man, that's a crazy message. How many believe it's, it's a real message, though? We need this. How many believe we need this today? God's making us strong. Now, before we leave this place, um, I, want, I want everybody to really pay attention because why would, we, why would a person be willing to die or, be, or suffer or be beat for a mission? Well, you'd have to find out first what is the mission. And the mission is you. The reason I put my job on the line, because I care more about everyone in that room and that general manager than I do myself. His eternity is at stake, dependent on my response. So why would I be willing? I, I, I remember when, when God told me to leave my, my job, I was making $300,000 a year. And he told me, leave the job and become the full-time pastor of the Way World Outreach. And it made no sense. I just built my dream house in Yakaipa. I was, I, was, I was set up, really I could be set up to become an owner. Things were set up for me. I put 14 years in the industry. I was doing really well. And the church had zero money. We had no money in the church. We barely could pay the bills in the church. And now God's telling me, give it all up and come to San Bernardino. Sell your house that you just built and move into a city that's hurting and broken. I want to touch some people's lives. And I remember selling that house. And I remember going home. And when I got home, I told Lisa, we're selling everything. I remember I was driving a brand new Denali. I had to turn that in. And I drove home in a little Saturn with 300,000 miles. And I showed up to my 4,700 square foot home that I just finished putting a pool in. It was beautiful, landscaping, brought in palm trees. It I mean, it looked like a casino. It was beautiful. I just finished putting flooring, travertine. I, I put I, 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 iron, stair iron staircase. I was set. It, was, it had a five-car garage. I go, this is the house I've worked so hard for. And God said, sell it all and go to San Bernardino. And I remember, but I go, the church can't support my family. He goes, I will support your family. And I remember he told me, sell the house. And I sold that house. Within a month period of time, it sold. I took the equity out of the house. And that's how we, that's how we began to even do this church and be able to supply my family's needs and be able to get through. I, was, I lived off that money and helped the church build. 
But the question is, why would someone be willing to give all that up? I'm willing to give it all up because you're important. I love you. God loves you. And all those sacrifices are way worth it for you. So that's why someone would be willing to die because they're passing on the love that God showed them and God loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him. Your life is very short. It could come, it could go, come. Um, this week, actually it was Monday, me and Lisa almost died. And it's so quick for someone to die, like boom, it's done, it's over. One minute, just a second, me and Lisa are dead. I'm on the 210 freeway, Monday. It's around seven o'clock, seven something. I'm driving on a fast lane, going towards San Bernardino East. There's another car on the shoulder of the fast lane that's going 80 miles per hour. So we're ready, we're going ready to go on a head-on collision. By the time I saw that car, I could not react. 70 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour, we're both going around 70, 80. It would have been a 150 mile per hour collision. I saw that car, there was no room for me to move. I couldn't move, I was stuck there. He passed right by me and you could see the cloud of dust and tires and everything that were in, the, in, in that, that, that shoulder. A dust, Lisa sees the dust, like there was a car just passed by us at 70 miles per hour on the shoulder of the fast lane. So um, yesterday, I go, that guy, I, I, I said, that guy just wants to commit suicide. So I looked up the, I looked up the, I looked to see if something happened on 210 freeway. Well, something did happen. Probably a minute later, he ran in head-on collision with, with, a, with, with, a, with a Tesla Model S, and both cars explode and they both die. That was probably five cars behind me, six cars behind me. He was just picking which car he was going to go head on with. He somehow passed me up. And I thank God he passed me up. Because me and Lisa would be dead or really in intensive care. It was really that bad. But it reminded me this, how important this moment is. Because tomorrow's not guaranteed for you. That one day you're going to, I want you to think about, the, I want you to think about your eternal life. We have a mission as a church to do everything we can to save a soul. And say, so why would I want to give my life to Jesus? First of all, he's the only source of eternal life. Once you leave this earth, if you don't have Jesus, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only one that died for our sins. He died for your sins. Jesus did not come to judge you. He came to save you and pay the price for every wrong thing you've done. He loves you and he wants a relationship with you. Second thing, why would I want to give my life to Jesus? Because you can have some peace in your life. Jesus said, the peace I give you, the world cannot give you. The weed cannot give you. The drinking cannot give you. The sex out of marriage cannot give you. You're searching. There's an emptiness inside of you. And God is saying, you're searching and you can't find it. And the more you search, the emptier you are. I'm letting you know something. God wants to give you eternal life. God wants to forgive you of your sins. God wants to give you a new beginning. But he also wants to give you some peace. Come on, does anybody want some peace in their life? And the third thing, why would I want to give my life to Jesus? I'll tell you number three. Freedom. God wants to set you free. When my daughter said there's someone with a spirit of suicide and you were struggling with suicidal thoughts, that's what that guy was struggling with. He's on a freeway in an Ultima at 70 miles per hour trying to find someone to kill him. And he did it. So right now, you're saying, Pastor, I'm fighting this thing. I know you're fighting it, but there's someone that wants to help you fight. He wants you to be set free. He wants you to be set free from the anger. He wants you to get set free from the depression. He wants you to get set free from the addiction. He wants you to get set free from the pornography. He wants to get you free. Wouldn't it be great for you to be free, that you can live a new life, have a desire to live a new life, and start succeeding, but without this thing keep bringing you down? So if you're in this room, I want you to think about this. If today were your last day on earth, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Because after death, the Bible says, there's a point of man a day to die. After that is judgment. You stand before God. Then you might be saying, Pastor, 
I believe I'll go to heaven. I'll say, why? And you say, I believe I'll go to heaven because I'm a pretty good person. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you go to heaven because you're a good person. You only go to heaven when you call upon the name of Jesus. What, what that means is, yes, you've done good, some good stuff, but you're not going to be judged for the good stuff you've done. You're going to be judged for the cr spiritual crimes and sins you've committed. And that way, we're all guilty. But I got good news for you. You did the crime. Jesus did the time. He paid the bail so you could be forgiven and set free. Today's your day to be forgiven. Today's your day to have a brand new start. Today's your day finally to get some peace. Today's your day to make some peace with God. If you're here in this room, and I'm going to count to three, I say, Pastor, I've heard this word. There's two groups of people. One of you is saying, you know, I've heard this word, and I need to recommit my life to the Lord. I've been ta being taken out at lower levels, and it stopped me from being effective. But tonight, I'm ready as a man, as a woman of God, I'm ready to surrender it all. I want to see God use me to the fullest so I can affect my family and and make an impact on my city and make an impact on the people that know me. I'm ready to give my life totally for the cause, to give my life for Jesus. That's one. I need to recommit my life to the Lord. Number two, you're in this room and say, Pastor, if I were to die right now, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. But I want to make peace with God right now. If I was on that freeway and I was in that Tesla and I were to die instantly, both cars went into flames, be burned alive in that car. I don't know if I'd be ready to stand before God, but I don't want to leave here not knowing that I could be forgiven and receive the quality of life that God has for me. I want to give my life to Jesus, or I want to get set free. I'm tired of this cycle of destruction, pain, anxiety, fear. I need a change in my life. I need Jesus to set me free. I've tried to change, but I can't do it. Bow your heads, close your eyes for a second. When I count to three, say, Pastor, that's me. When I say three, I want you to raise your hand. That's me. I want to be forgiven of my sins. or I need to recommit my life to the Lord. I'm ready. I'm ready to make a difference. Or if I were to die right now, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure if I'm going to die right now, I'd go to heaven. But I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to make sure before I leave here, I'm right. When I count to three, one, I want you to raise your hand. Don't let nothing hesitate. hesitate because right now, this is your moment. Two, when I say three... I want you to raise your hands all over this building saying, that's me. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building saying, that's me. Proud of every one of you. That's one. That's two. That's three. Over there. All of them. Over there. Right 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 over here. Over here. Over here. Over here. That's awesome. Way in the back over there. Come on. Someone's life's going to be transformed forever. I want those to raise their hands. Will you do me one more big favor? Will you allow me the privilege of praying with you? I want you to leave your seat and come up here. We're not going to embarrass you. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pray for you. And this is a sign of you leaving your seat and starting a new life with God. I'm leaving my old life in those seats. I'm leaving my addiction in those seats. I'm leaving, come on, I'm leaving my anxiety in those seats. I want to start a new life. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Someone's giving their life to Jesus. If you raise your hand, come forward. Ask your name. You want to go up there, go up there with you. This is what I want you to do. Jesus said, follow me and be my disciple. He didn't say, follow me and be my friend alone. Or follow me and believe in me. Or follow me and be a fan. Or follow me and be a member of a church. He said, follow me and be my disciple. When Jesus called people to follow him, this is what happened. They would leave everything and follow him. They would literally, and back in those days, leave their careers and follow him. I'm telling you to do that. But I'm telling you, leave your old life and follow him. And when you become a disciple, you're saying, God, Jesus, I want you to mentor me. I want you to train me. I want to be like you. So being a disciple is making a commitment. I want to be like you, think like you. I want to have your character, your habits. 
I want people to see you in me. So what's going to happen when you give your life to Jesus today, you recommit your life to the Lord, God's spirit is going to come and live inside of you. But he doesn't live inside of you to live inside of you. He lives inside of you to empower you to live a new life. Okay? So we're going to believe that God's going to set you free from tormenting thoughts. God's going to set you free from addictions and bad habits. We're going to believe this, that the anxiety is going to go, that the fear is going to go, that the depression is going to go, the suicidal thoughts are going to go, and joy is going to come in, and peace is going to come in, and strength is going to come in. We're going to believe there's going to be exchange today. Are you ready to make that exchange? Are you done living the life of the life you've been living? I'm following Jesus. So after this, we're going to pray. Your next step, if you just gave your life to Jesus, is starting at the way. Next Tuesday, I'm going to be teaching. You should be there. It's like signing up for school. You got to show up to class. Show up to class. And the more you show up, the more you're going to grow. You're going to be exposed to the Word of God. You're going to be exposed to Christians, believers. Some of you, you're just exposed your way. What that means, you have too much demonic and worldly exposure to live for God. You need more godly exposure to live for God. You understand that? You got to cut off some old friends. I'm living for God. Are you ready? Are you ready to surrender all? All in tonight. Proud of every one of you for praying. Let's pray for them right now. Bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Set me free from all addictions, torment, bad habits, bad thinking. Make me new. I believe you died on a cross to pay the price for all the wrong I've done. Make me new tonight. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord. I receive the free gift of eternal life. From this day forward, I am a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ till the day I die and for eternity. In Jesus' name, I accept my freedom. I receive it right now. And I receive peace, a good night's rest, and purpose. Use me, Lord, to reach my world. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand on this Wednesday night. This is the greatest place to be on a Wednesday night, better than any place in the world. God bless you, church. Have a safe trip home. Enjoy your evening. God bless you. Remember this, if God is for you, there's no one can come against you. Any prayer? Come on up. I'd love to pray with you. This is your moment of freedom. This is your moment of peace. This is your moment to live the eternal life that God has for you.